Our next talk is PyTest, Rapid and Simple Testing with Py Python. And our speaker is Holger, Holger Krekel. Thank you. OK, I'm going to start right away. Um, thanks all for coming. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give a talk on various aspects of uh, testing, starting talking a bit and connecting to when you have been to the other talks. For testing this morning, I'm going to connect to uh, what Gary Bernard had to say about testing tiles and styles and also some other people. And I'm going to talk about PyTest, of course, and its unique features and uh, a bit about plugins and why people choose it over other frameworks and so on. For me, um, for my, um, who am I actually? I'm involved in the Python community since 10 years. And I think it started with the first EuroPython and first PyCon that I really got into things. And I, like in 2003, I was one of the persons actually starting the PyPy project and was a core developer for a couple of years. I also started PyTest at around the same time. PyPy is using it, and it evolved as a separate project. I also did things like Exignet, where you can have hybrid development with like Python 3 and Python 2. And also recently did a tool called Tox, which kind of like tries to standardize testing in Python. That's a bit of my background. I also did some consulting and teaching and lots of different things, but these are at least the projects I'm involved in. And so you can see where I'm coming from. When I'm talking about types of testing in the last, I don't know, um, eight years or something, I took like different stances. So this is kind of like my up-to-date view on how I view testing. And I think it makes a lot of sense to talk about fine-grained tests or so-called unit tests. They usually deal with a single function or a single class that you actually test the behavior um, for. And they're usually very fast to run. We had like whole talks focusing on this. Very fast to run. And they give you very specific failures. That means that if you get a failure, you know what is going wrong. Problem is, if you have like a large system with lots of unit tests, like the PyPy project has something like over 15,000 now. Um, and not all of them unit tests, but a lot of them actually deal with like fine-grained machinery. So if you actually start refactoring, you have to change a lot of things. That's why I say it takes somewhat of a high maintenance uh, as, as the system gets larger. You also have to do in larger systems some kind of monkey patching sometimes to be able to even instantiate a class because you need to have some database connection and so on. So um, you need to do something like monkey patching, mocking, and you need to use fixtures already. Then integration testing, I recommend to rather subsume this usually under unit testing at least in the Python world. Um, it means that you have like several pieces of your code, but still very little, like two or three maybe or so, that, you, that, they, that interact with each other. Like you need one class to instantiate the other, and then you perform some tests. That's already what most people would call an integration test. They're usually also fast to run, and they share many of the problems, uh, not, not problems, many of the aspects and and uh, conditions under which unit tests run and can be refactored. The most interesting, different type of test is really the one that is usually referred to as functional tests or system testing. So those are really the, the two like on the far end. You have like, as a programmer, you have like the unit tests and you have like the things that more or less involve the whole system. There you need something like, kind of like whole application fixtures. You need to have your whole application set up in a way that you can actually do some kind of testing that comes more from the outside, like sending web requests to it and things like this. Um, by the way, if you actually want to interrupt, I'm usually fine with that and just raise your hand and say something, um, especially if it's like a small question, not like big comments maybe, but a small question, then we can just directly uh, interact there. I actually prefer that. So, um, functional tests also connect to acceptance tests and UI level tests. Like what I just said about um, 
uh, a system having to be set up in order to perform some tests like web requests. It really means that you might actually end up doing like lock in this user, things like what Selenium does, lock in this user, perform this action, see what the outcome is and so on. And for that you actually also need uh, similar fixtures that you need for your functional tests that you write as a programmer. So they usually live in this world uh, and connect to the functional tests. The PyTest basically has different mechanisms and it aims to make it very easy and rapid to write simple unit tests, but it also aims to support a very advanced way of, uh, of writing functional tests. Advanced in a sense I'm going to explain in more detail. But you can imagine if there are projects that use it for like 100 tests and other projects using it for like 17,000 tests, that there must be some different mechanisms uh, getting used. And that's actually in the focus over the 10 years that this testing tool got developed. So, why PyTest? Um, a few basic things. It's, especially if you compare it to unit tests, there's of course also nose. And just to get a good uh, idea of this audience, actually, a lot of you are probably using Nose, is that right? Can you raise your hand? Oh, not so many, actually, okay. And uh, PyTest already? Thank you. And the standard unit test thing? Okay. And no, no kind of like testing framework at all currently? Okay. Thank you. Um, so it's cross Python, and that means that it runs on any any kind of Python that runs on Python 2.4 and runs on Python 3.2 or 3.3 or runs on PyPy. It's kind of like the, the versions that get released of PyTest always run on all of these versions. It's kind of a promise. So we're not, I mean, if there's not really a strong reason, there's not going to be like dropped support for older versions, which is uh, kind of important, I think. In unit test, it's usually tied to the installed Python. So if new features are introduced, it's kind of not so easy to use them if you still want to remain compatible to older versions. In, it has what I would call, and many other people call, a Pythonic style in terms of writing tests. It doesn't, it supports, like you can run unit tests actually with PyTest, no problem. Like the standard unit tests. Just type it in and, and it collects your tests and runs them. But um, it also supports a simpler style of actually getting started with your tests that very much connects also to more advanced testing. And the Pythonic style uh, also includes a different way to set up resources. And that's like one main topic of the thing, uh, of this talk, um, especially the test resource injection topic. So when I say Pythonic style, it means um, no boilerplate, basically. This is like a complete application plus test. And it uses the bare assert statement, and you run it by um, typing the uh, py, typing uh, py test test sorry um, underscore sample .py, or just py test if it's uh, there in your directory. It automatically finds the test as well because it has this test underscore prefix. And then you, uh, if you actually do this, then you get. Let's just do that actually see that the font is big enough. I hope it's visible. Let's see. So if we do this, um, then we'll see um, the uh, certain kind of reporting. And PyTest puts a lot of effort, actually. Um, and there's been many contributions, actually, to, to improve the reporting. And here you see that the assert statements fails and it gives you the intermediate values. And it's in some sense more Pythonic than other approaches because uh, you don't need to remember any kind of names like assert equals dictionary, assert this and this and that to get good reporting. You just use the assert statement. And that's one of the main features that has been perfected lately. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about this. Um, so I just showed you this example. Here you see uh, at the beginning like the platform and, and there was like one test item collected and then the assert intermediate values and it shows you in which kind of line um, the in which kind of in which line you know, the error comes from and what happens if you have like more complex um, assertions for example list comparisons um, 
There you actually hear I construct um, the application basically in the test to make it all on one page. I have two lists, I compare them, and you see what, what is being done here. It's um, the assert actually tries to make sure that it doesn't like extend over like pages and pages or something like this. It kind of like uh, does the dot 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 thing um, to indicate the assertion failure. And then it tells you at index five, there's a difference between the two lists. And also the left, con it also tells you the left contains more items. These are two important aspects that you usually have to pass out of your uh, objects and make it harder actually to, to read a failing test. So also uh, by default there is uh, kind of like diff support for string comparisons, also multi-line. That means that if you compare two strings, then you get a diff actually and they fail because they are not equal, you actually uh, get a direct marker of where your string is different, right? And again, this is all, you don't need to know any special names, any special methods that you have to call to get this output, you just get it by default. Then you can customize this. So if you have object instances and you compare them, then you might actually want in your tests to print some attribute values or get to um, show something about the state of the um, object. And you can do this without modifying your actual production code by introducing uh, something which, is, which you can see here. This is just the, the only fragment that you need here is that you um, implement a certain hook called pytest.assert.compare and PyTest actually calls this to print the information about your comparison. So here we check actually, okay, if we actually are comparing foo instances and the operation that was used is in equals equals, then I want to actually display this, right? The comparing foo val attributes. So above here, you see that the representation of the failing assert is suddenly these two lines, like this is the first line and this is the second which is exactly what we are producing here. So you can make um, custom things with your objects without changing your production code at all. So you don't need to have like, have like growing wrappers or do things that you don't actually want to do. You only do it for testing purposes. You can actually put it in some corner of your test support code to do this. Um, this, would, this definition would appear in a so-called conftest.py file, which resides in your testing directory. Right? I talk about this, it's kind of like the local plug-in mechanism. Yes, so some people, especially like, I don't know, two years ago or so, they referred to this and said, oh yeah, you're doing these assert things and re-evaluating to get the intermediate values and you do all, all kinds of things with that. Isn't that very magic? And that has been true for something like six or seven years. But lately, uh, like last year, um, we introduced uh, so what I call perfect assertions. That means there are no side effects whatsoever. What happens actually is that your test files get, um, there's an AST, an abstract syntax tree transformation, that actually um, rewrites the assert statements only in the test modules. And there we actually store the information we later retrieve when we print the failing test. You don't see any of that? You can uh, look at the code. Actually, Benjamin Peterson has, has done this code, who is also a very active Python dev and PyPy developer. And it's, uh, it works seamlessly by now. It's a couple of versions later. There were some things that we had to fix still, but I think it works now very well. So there are no side effects. There will, there's no re-evaluation. Just in case you have heard about this like two years ago, and if people are telling you, uh, you know, it's all magic, then ask them again about uh, this new feature. And if they don't know it, then you know uh, what to think of it. Um, so that's like two very basic things, uh, one very basic thing, the whole assert reporting and cross Python. And then we talk about test resource injection now. What I'm not going to talk much about is automatic discovery of tests. Uh, Nose also does this, and I'm only briefly going to talk about plugins and the extensive documentation. There's also a PDF, a manual kind of thing that you can use and so on. So, test resource injection. That's now related to the more advanced usage. There's a third thing you can just use right away. You don't need to know anything. Just use it, write your tests with it, be done. 
Pest resource injection is, relates to what people have called earlier in the day uh, dependency injection. And it means that you basically just means that you can pass arguments or you can have arguments for your test functions. So here I have a test function that actually takes what I call my func arg, which is often a used term and also easy to Google actually um, in the PyTest documentation. And this argument actually is constructed by PyTest. It calls a matching function to construct this um, argument. And, and then it runs the test function with that. And here I just assert, it's just a simple example, that um, what I get in here is uh, equal 17. And here is actually the factory function that creates the value. And it's going to be a different one, so it doesn't work. Um, so if I, do, if I do this and run it, then of course you still get the uh, assert um, representation and it tells you that this argument actually isn't that. And the important bit here is that um, it's kind of like disconnected. You say here in this test function I want to have a certain resource injected and PyTest has a documented, defined way how to actually find this resource can be in different places. And there's a very, um, there's, a, there's a switch, a command line switch called minus minus func args that shows you all of the available resources that you can have in your test functions. There are some global helpers and there are some project specific things that you can define for yourself. So the global things. For example, you can have an argument, you can use an argument simply, which is called tempdir. So the temp deer example is that you basically just say, okay, I want to have a temp deer, and uh, this is by default is a unique temporary directory for your test. So um, when you have like multiple tests, each of, and you use the temp deer thing, then it will, there will be an empty um, temporary directory managed by PyTest. And if, you, if this actually goes wrong, Let's just write this, sorry. Yes. So it's really like this. So if it, if it just goes wrong because it's a simple failure, that's really all I need, then you're not only, you're going to see actually the objects that were injected into the test function, which is this one. So you directly see it's a it's this directory that I'm using in my test function. So you can just directly go there and check what kind of state was created there in case you create some files there and so on. So that's just globally there for any project, actually, for anything using PyTest. And um, there is also another um, func arc which is called monkey patch. And there you can actually uh, perform wild monkey patching of your system, like patch out some functions on some object and things like this, and at the end of the test function it's going to be reverted. So you don't need to care about this at all. It's always going to happen. After the test everything is cleaned up. And I gave you two examples here, maybe the, this one first. Here I, monkey patch has like several methods it offers you. One is set utter, another one is set item, and so on. The set utter means that I can um, set an attribute um, on a module in this case, and I make it so that I actually substitute what is returned here. So the OSPath expand user just returns um, ABC in this case. And now if I call this OSPath expand user, I get ABC back, right? Forget about the assert zero. The assert zero is always just, for me, a way to quickly fail and, and look at some value or something like this. So, and you can also do this with environment variables and so on. And it's a very, sorry, it's a very easy way to, uh, and very secure way to deal with mocks and, and um, attributes like this. So that's also generally available. Um, what is also generally available is, um, is parameterization. So if you have a test function that takes a certain uh, argument, you can say, okay, please parameterize me this and call this function multiple times with different values, right? And that's done via um, a decorator, uh, a marker, 
how it's called in PyTest. There are several bits of markers. Here we just use the parameterized marker. And we say the argument num iter, number of iterations here, should be from the list of 0 to 9, so range, range 10. And then you see above that we are going to ru uh, run 10 tests here, and it collects 10 test items. And due to the way the assert is written here, only the last test actually fails for this parameter. So that also relates to you can actually uh, call a test function multiple times with different values. Now, this is all already quite interesting, but I only showed you uh, function arguments that are kind of like simple, like here they are just integers, or in the other case it's kind of like a temporary directory, which is a bit more interesting already, or the monkey patch one, which uh, allows you to safely patch your system and revert to the old state afterwards. The thing that is most interesting in real-life applications, and that's why I gave you, I'm, I'm, I have here a real-life application, is that you can separate your fixtures from your test function, be it organized in classes, test modules, across directories, it doesn't matter, and the place where you actually provide and construct those fixtures. And that's kind of like a thing that you rather use like for system level testing or higher level testing. And it means this is like a real life example from the ExecNet project, which I'm also doing. And here you see, this is like a basic test. A gateway is one Python interpreter connecting to another Python interpreter. And you can actually send values in both directions and execute code on the other interpreter. So Quora.com, for example, is using this to connect Python two with Python three and execute code there and vice versa and send values to and fro. And ExecNet has a large test suite. And here you see that there is the GW, which is the shortcut for gateway. And this test actually assumes I have somehow a working gateway. And now I make some assumptions like, is it correctly set up? Does it have a receiver thread? Does it really have an ID? Does, is it actually specified by some string which I, by which I can reconstruct the gateway and so on? And I do this. And um, I do it also for, uh, like here, I do a remote test. I actually, it's a bit more effort actually. And what I do is I also use the temp deer to create some files, and I use the gateway. So of course, you can use multiple function arguments. And you could put some parameterization on top of that. Now, the thing is, the test code is not concerned at all with constructing these objects. The test code can just assume, OK, I have like a working example instance here of, of a basic gateway, and now I actually start doing my things. And then again, in a conf test, I can define this kind of factory function. And this object here allows me to interact with the test. And I'm not going to, to go through all of the details here. But uh, this request object gives you a lot of power, actually, to, to um, set up your resources and to perform cached setups of resources lasting the whole session. So when there's the first test that actually requests a certain resource, only then will like a certain database template or whatever, in this case it's, it's like a certain gateway, will be created. And here it's interesting that you can actually define a scope. And it's, the scope here is defined dynamically. And that means that I have two ways to actually run a test. If I um, run the test from um, just like this, like on my developer console, like this, then I'm going to get a shared fixture. That means the gateway is going to be the same for all of the methods in the class, even for all of the methods in a module. Right? I'm using always the same gateway object. And of course, if one test actually messes up the state, the next test might fail. So this is actually not something you'd like to do in your, in your continuous integration, like commit-based tests. What you do there is actually you pass, and you see this took like 11 seconds, um, you pass an option, which is defined by the ExecNet project. Um, let me see. Sorry. Um, 
Hmm. It's a bit large font for me. Um, so like this. Now I have it, sorry. Um, here. Here, actually, the ExactNet testing options, which are added by the project, they allow me um, like uh, to, to, to modify the scope under which fixtures are actually set up. So what I do here, um, but the default is actually do a session based. So for all of the tests using a certain basic type of gateway, always reuse the same one. But when I say um, like this um, function, then it's going to be created, recreated for each function. It's going to take much longer, right? And this is something that you can drive from the command line and you can influence, you can use this from the continuous integration to have like the slow tests and like fully isolated tests. And for the developer, you just do like the, sh the quick thing. It's related to what um, Gary Bernhard talked in the last talk about regarding his uh, nose plugin, but this is built in and it's kind of like a side effect of a more general feature. Okay, um, so the, the separation from test code and fix, um, fixture code gives a lot of freedom to actually of uh, like configuring your test setup that you don't have if you actually use the standard X unit way of encoding the levels of of, of setting up things into your source code directly. You say set up class, you say set up method, you say set up module and, and all those kind of things, but then there's no way to change this from the command line anymore because it's really intertwined in your whole source code. And this is actually a very simple way to, um, or this is actually a very good way to, has been proven to be a good way to, to have a cleaner separation between those two aspects. So, that's test resource injection. There's lots more. I say go check out the um, documentation. Um, so, let me just quickly talk about plugins and extensions. There's tons of plugins um, for uh, PyTest. You can also do your local plugin, like in your test directory, you have a conf test file, and that's the same as if you would like distribute um, your own plugin. You can actually have your own extensions there. And if you actually want to distribute it, you can repackage it and just release it to PyP and, and have other people actually use it easily. One such example is Xdist, which I'm going to show quickly. Um, sorry. Ah, fun for so if I run... If I run the... Xtest example, which is this one. This is just um, four tests, um, which take increasingly long to run uh, because they just wait the number of seconds they are passed in. So it takes like one second, two seconds, four seconds, and that should be like ten seconds in the end. And if you use distributed testing, like use four sub-processes then this is going to take um, less time. It takes one second, one second, one second, because four tests are actually started in parallel. And so it doesn't really matter if, the first, if one test um, waits one second and the next one two seconds, because they start at the same time. And you can actually verify that this is the case with a feature called durations profiling. So show me the 10 uh, slowest tests, actually, and including the setup functions. So here you see that I have like um, the, the, the xdist test that gets passed in the parameter 4 here. It takes 4 seconds, obviously. And so on, but you see the overall time in the end is still just 5 seconds, because they just run in parallel, right? So that's the xdist plugin. Um, I'm sorry. Um, so there's many others. You can, of course, create JUnit XML, and, and there's a pytest.wim plugin for, I think there's going to be a lightning talk about this by Alfredo. And there is a PEP8 checker that has like configurable checks for testing your application source code against PEP8 compliance. There's coverage, of course, and recently there's a timeout plugin, so that if your tests take too long, there are several methods to interrupt them, and so on. So, 
One more thing I'm going to mention at the end. I still have, sorry, five minutes. Or? Um, one thing that PyTest does from the beginning and has now refined a bit more, actually, is you can have your own testing language, right? You can, you can say, I want to have this as the defini definition of my tests. And with PyYAML installed, um, this is actually how the reporting looks like. So here we're really run, running um, test simple.jml. Test simple.jml, and the reporting is completely custom. So it doesn't include any kind of Python trace backs anymore. You can uh, invent your own testing language here. And how this is done is. Um, uh, where is that? No, I'm actually going to sh not show that in detail. This is a mechanism that is documented on the website. Uh, there's an example actually for exactly this output I'm showing you and how you can make it yourself. It's like 15, 20 lines of code and you have kind of this output and can define your own testing language and can define what does a certain data input lead to in terms of application calls and how is it actually reported. And of course you can mix your Python tests with this. So you can have a couple of those files and a couple of Python files, and those get the normal Python test runs, and the other ones get, um, get the domain-specific testing language. And of course, you can share resources between those. So project users, um, there are many of them. They are listed, actually. What I've liked very much to hear, of course, being one of the authors of PyTest, um, is that people from Fedora actually, are they actually here? Ah, great. I'm, I'm not misrepresenting you. <laughs> You're still the opinion. Um, came to the conclusion after comparing um, Nose and, and PyTest that they're both quite capable and that um, PyTest has like better documentation and more detailed output and so on. And I think the Mozilla WebQA people also came to similar conclusions. And that's, I think, also related to um, PyTest since two years has like the version 2 series, which like cleaned up lots of code. Like uh, the code was reduced by 40% or 50%. So lots of cleanup and all things thrown out. And by now, most of the projects, there was like small headaches for larger projects who used some like corner features. But by now, I think most of the people have um, uh, converted. And the releases now, actually, like in 2011, there have been two, four, six, eight, nine releases. So there's like really a lot of releases. If you have any bugs or contributions, they're going to make their way in very fast. And yes, so I hope you. Uh, take part on this. Also, if you actually like what I'm very interested about, I like to do like uh, real-world scenario-driven example documentation. So if you have something where you have a problem, then please post it to the testing and Python list or to the PyTest development list and um, say what you're trying to do and then someone is going to try to help you and make an example of how this uh, works. Don't be afraid, just do this. It really helps us actually finding good examples that people really need, instead of like inventing all kinds of examples that might make sense in some abstract manner. So that's really a very good contribution to do, and I invite you to do that. Okay, so that's the talk, and I'd like to take some questions if I still have the time. How does PyTest integrate with something like Django? That's a topic I'd like to address on Monday morning uh, <laughs> during sprints. The problem is I haven't been using Django myself. There's two plugins. The one is, I think, called Django PyTest, and the other one is called PyTest Django or something. But I'm not sure they're actually both uh, maintained very well. Actually, I think they are not. And uh, so I think the story with integration, with respect to integration in Django hasn't, is not very good in some sense, but it's mainly a matter of actually people pushing for it and, and doing some bits. It's not, there's no fundamental thing actually keeping it from copying some of what Nose is doing there maybe or using more interesting 
resource injection features, like what I'm talking about here, these kind of like, you get some argument, like Zope is doing that, for example. There's a PyTest Zope um, <laughs> extension, and they have a nice function argument where you can do all kinds of things with, right? And only if you use these features, certain things get set up and so on. So it's really, it's quite doable, but myself, I haven't had the need. And so, yes. Yes? Um, is there a way to get PyTest to output the um, standard out, standard error results when there's no failure? Um, yes. I was just looking at the documentation to find that out before. Yeah, maybe it's not directly obvious. Let's say our test sample, I, did, I mean, of course, I didn't mention all the features. So if you do this, for example, and you run this, then what you mean is that if I run this like this, then I get the captured standard out, right? But you want to see it directly. And then what you do is you pass the minus S option, and then this doesn't happen. So when the test is run here, you actually directly see the, the output here, right? Only if it's a failure, though, right? Uh, no, sorry. Uh, you always see this. Right? It's maybe more obvious if you run in verbose mode, then no, it's not. Um, but if you, if you write uh, something like print hello multiple times, then it's going to be obvious. <laughs> okay? This is not the same as showing it in like captured output because, I mean, if you really, are, if you really need this and this minus s is not enough for your real life use cases, then we can think about integrating this. But, but I think the minus s usually is enough for that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you, you talked that, that in the uh, past few um, uh, versions uh, there was a major cleanup. Um, but could you give us a, a little a little bit of a sneak peek of what uh, what things are coming in pilot test in future releases and what what things are you planning? Yes, I think the main bits actually is um, are really going to focus around like some improved documentation. And there's not any single big thing. There's going to be a parametrization, stabilization thing. So the 2.2 series have been about this new parametrized mechanism. Um, and there have been some big fixes related to this. And the next big thing, I think, is some kind of integration with TOX. Not really integration in that sense. It should also continue to run with Nose and other runners but um, making PyTest kind of like produce an output that can be processed by TOX and, um, and, and basically help you in testing against different configurations and uh, have a better view like in HTML and things like this. But there's no big things currently scheduled from my side actually. So I think it's rather complete currently and there's lots of things to do of course, but it's not going to change that much in the, let's say, next year, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, does does PyTest support test generation? Kind of like test what? Test generation. So test what? generation. Well, um, can you say a bit what you mean by that? So I use nose to generate functions, and then I can yield functions and arguments. Test generation. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, test the the yield mechanism that knows copied um, from PyTest, actually is still in. It's still in PyTest, you can still use it, but it's not advertised because the new way to actually do parameterization is much more powerful and integrates like with all the other features much, much better. The yielding is kind of like cool if you do it the first time, but it gives you all kinds of problems. And I'm not sure, but I think Nose 2 is actually also trying to get rid of that, right? So I don't think, it's not advertised by PyTest anymore, but the new test resource injection, including parameterization, including like the full dynamism, is like the way to go, in my opinion. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much.